the sutra bequeathed teachings and the eight awarenesses of a great human being by Dogen Zinji. Um, so I thought I would share a little bit with you about the six realms of experience. And to begin with, we have a lovely picture, almost a lovely picture. So the six realms of existence is, there's a traditional tanka in the Tibetan tradition, a, tra a traditional image that's often put on the front of monasteries. And the image is a circle enclosed in the jaws of a large being, who has a tiger's tail. And that large being is the central theme of the Tanka, the teaching. And that large being that holds all the realms of existence, that holds all the different states of mind, that holds all the places the beings can be, is impermanence. And sometimes they say it's the demon of death, but that isn't quite accurate from my perspective. It just means everything is changing constantly. And this wheel is about samsara. The, the samsara is the endless cycle of becoming. You know, we're never stuck, as we often say. We're always becoming. We're always, the next moment always moves. So if the arm is up in the top, it inevitably comes down sooner or later to the bottom. If it's on the bottom, it inevitably goes up to the top. It inevitably, everything moves. Nothing stays the same. So, this impermanence is the, the view that holds all the states of mind, all the states of experience, all the states of existence in its field, in its jaws. So we're all in realms of, ex realms of experience, realms of existence. We're all in some realm or other. So there's many realms. And we can look at these realms in three different ways. We can look at them physically, that there are physical places that we can point to and say there is a certain hellish realm. We can look at them psychologically and say, oh, you know, my own mind is creating a hell right here. We can look at them uh, from a more esoteric perspective, that there are realms that we cannot see. There are realms that are beyond the, the human sensory apparatus to understand. After all, our, our understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum is very, very small with our senses. And our eye tunes out, filters out most of the information. So there's lots of other realms that we can't see. <clears throat> the traditional six realms of existence uh, and this this particular way of, of slicing the coin is the human realm. Then there's a, an Ashura realm, a realm of titans, a realm of fighting gods, a realm of demigods, which we chant in the uh, Sutra on Entering Vasali. There's a, a heavenly realm. There are lower realms. There's an animal realm. There's a realm of hungry ghosts, pretas, and there's a hellish realm. And in the, they're hot and cold hells. So this is the traditional picture, the demon of impermanence, holding all the realms of experience, all the realms of existence. Now at the very core of these, of this symbol, um, whether you can see it or not, is a, a snake, a cock, and a cockerel. A snake, a cockerel, and a pig. And this is the pivot around which the ordinary world of samsara, of change, that's the fuel. And the fuel, I like to think of it as, as some machine or some fish in the ocean that kind of sucks in water and then spews it out and sucks in and spews it out and sucks in and spews it out and so has, so propels itself along. And at the core of this is greed, sucking everything in, anger, 
pushing everything away, and ignorance about the process that's going on. So the, the, at the core, right at the very center, snake, cock, boar, pushing, pulling, pushing, pulling, pushing, pulling, liking, disliking, liking, disliking, liking, disliking, wanting, not wanting, wanting, not wanting, it should be this way, it shouldn't be this way, it should be this way, it shouldn't be this way. And that is the fuel that keeps the whole cycle going. It doesn't make any difference to impermanence, it's just still impermanent. But that's the fuel that keeps the world moving along, keeps us all moving along. Now on this um, wheel there are several parts. We're going to just go right to the, the six slices of the pie. And the six slices of the pie, yeah, thank you, it's good, are, um, as I mentioned, can be states of mind, places, or things that are beyond our kin, or all three. So if we start at the bottom with the hellish realms, the hot hells and the cold hells, the hells of, of anger and fire, and the hells of resentment and jealousy and envy, the hot hells and the cold hells, we can create hellish states of mind. There are people who are walking around in hellish states of mind, filled with vile poison of anger and hatred, jealousy, envy. And of course, in a hell, the torturers and the tortured are both in hell. You know, it's not as though one of them is out of hell, one of them is in hell. The those who torture and those who are tortured are all in hell. All in hell because of the nature of their mind. In the Buddhist tradition, there, did you have a comment? If you, people have comments, you're welcome to interrupt me. It's all right. Well, again, we, we will talk about that little aspect in just a moment. Okay. There are places of, we'll call this extreme, infinite, deep, the bottom of the infinite well torture of many different kinds. Now, in the Buddhist tradition, we're never stuck. So even those beings, even those states of mind, even those realms of infinite torture and hell, we are never stuck. They're always changing. So from the Buddhist perspective, there's always hope. It's very different than the Judeo-Christian Judeo -Christian, Judeo -Christian tradition where you're in eternal hell, eternal heaven. It's always changing, always changing. And it's one of the things that if we think about a soul, if you have a, an idea that there's a soul, some substance, some some thing at the core that is divine and sacred, if it doesn't change, that means it's frozen. That means it never grows. That means it, it, can't, it can't understand. It can't get closer to God or further away from God. It can't have any karma, choice, action, thought has no effect. So even from a Buddhist perspective, what anybody calls the soul, that core thing, of it, it's just impermanent, it's just changing all the time too. Otherwise it couldn't learn. We couldn't learn. Now, in each of these six realms, the hellish realms on the bottom, are also the six realms. So there are, at the hellish realms, there is the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, the most painful of the most painful of the most painful, endless torture, which I don't think, as human beings, we can actually see. Um, there is a very interesting book by Sam Berkowitz in the library. Sam Berkowitz was the founder of the Shambhala Publishing Company and had a, a near-death experience. And the near-death experience that most people talk about is, you know, you go into the radiant white light and you see the tunnel and the great beings are calling you there and you see all your friends and family. Well, he had just the opposite experience. He had an experience of going into the hellish realms and going into and seeing them and feeling them very graphically, a torturous realm. And he, he, said, he brought it out and said, this is important. 
people really need to know this realm really exists. It's there. So there's a, a whole book which he's translated those experiences into something the human realm can appreciate. So in each of these realms includes all six realms. The bottom of the bottom of the bottom, which is beyond our kin, even beyond our understanding. Because we just don't have the senses for that. There's also heavenly parts of that. People are in better or worse hells. You know, there are people who are at the top of the hell pyramid and people at the bottom of the hell pyramid. And the six realms are still there. They're still cycling. Still cycling. Every realm. In the, the fundamental principle of the core, your greed, anger, and ignorance, the desire that keeps samsara turning, the desire that keeps the wheel turning, is everybody in hell wants something, wants something, wants something, wants something, wants something, and, and probably the intensity of the want is most intense in people who are in hellish realms. Most intense, because when we're really suffering, we really want to get out of suffering. We really desire to get out of suffering. And that desire has two sides to it. On one hand, that desire is what propels us into making change, pro propels us into doing good, propels us into the next higher state. At the same time, that desire is also the desire for liberation. And in every realm, um, can't see on this picture, I guess it was not a good picture. In every realm of these, there's a Buddha, a Jizo, and a Valakiteshvara. So even in a hellish realm, there is a Buddha, a Jizo, a Navalakateshvara, Kuan Yin, Shinrezi. Every realm has the possibility of liberation. So from one vantage point, we are in this constant cycle of becoming, 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 becoming. The people who are in hellish realms become the people in the hungry ghost realms. On the other hand, the Buddha is found right in the middle of our darkest nights, right in the middle of the darkest hells. And the possibility of liberation is always present. Every realm has the possibility of liberation. Sometimes people read this and they say, Okay, you got to get to the human realm, and the human realm is the realm where it has a mixture of suffering and pleasure, and because of that mixture we have free choice, and because of that choice we can choose to walk on the path of practice or not. But in reflecting on it, in my limited experience of these realms, every realm has a possibility of liberation. And how, what's the possibility of liberation in any realm? The possibility of liberation is about non-discrimination non-separation, before we divide the world in two. Before we divide the world in two. So if somebody is in a very dark realm, and that is the only realm there is, there is no other realm, there is no comparison, it's like if the whole world were pink, everything were pink, everything was the same shade of pink, you would not see pink. There is no comparison. There are just pinkness. Be pink, inside, outside, and in between. So that non-discrimination, that non-division, is one of the elements of awakening right there. And it doesn't mean the circumstances necessarily change, but the view changes and the slicing and dicing of our life changes. There's awakening in every realm. But people in hell want to get out of hell. They graduate, however that process happens. And the next realm of existence, whether it's sequential or not, is the hungry ghost realm, the preta realm, the, it's on the lower right corner, lower left corner as you face it, between seven and nine. The hungry ghost realm are, are, are typically, iconographically, is depicted as beings with <clears throat> enormous bellies and very small mouths. 
and they're hungry all the time, they're hungry all the time, they're craving, they're wanting, they're, they're really hungry, hungry. And it can't be fed, can't be fed, can't be fed. Small mouths, can't be fed. Tiny throats, nothing can go through. And so, as human beings, we are very familiar with those kind of states of craving. I'm sure everybody has been in these states of craving. I want it, I want it, I want it, I gotta have it, I gotta have it, I gotta have it. Whatever it happens to be. Never satisfied. But the most archetypal expression of that in the human realm to me is addiction. Addiction, no matter how much of the substance you're addicted to, you get, it's not enough, it's not enough, you want more, you want more, you want more. And that process is suffering. It's suffering. You can never be satisfied. And this, this particular realm can be either that place of us that's constantly craving and desiring and never satisfied and just restless and unhappy. I want, I want, I want, I want. It can be realms, there are realms of people who live and their world is nothing but the world of addiction. And they circle around the world of addiction. And there are realms that we can't see. Preta realms, realms of beings. And some of the chants that we do talk about these realms, the realms of beings, the realms of hungry ghosts, the realms of voracious desire that are all around us. If we tap into them, and of course, we tap into the voracious desire that's in us. There's liberation in that realm. Now, I often think of this as not circle, but as a vertical pyramid. At the very bottom <clears throat> are the hellish realms, and people who want to get out of the hellish realms kind of creep their way up into the hungry ghost realms, and people who finally have liberation in the hungry ghost realms creep up into the animal realms. The animal realms are typified by a lack of appreciation of causality. A lack of appreciation of causality. And because there's a lack of appreciation of causality, there is, you know, indulgence in food, sex, sleep, the things animals are often specialty. Healthy animals are a specialist at. In the animal realm, of course, there are six realms. There are animals who live in hell. There are animals who are, who are chased and beaten and killed and used as toys. And, and there are animals who live in heaven, pampered pets who are given great delicacies and taken to the vet whenever they sneeze. No. who are perfumed and pomenaded. So in every realm, there is other realms. It's not as though there is a realm called animals, but there are really you know, happy, happy animal realms, heavenly animal realms, and hellish animal realms. There is liberation even in those realms. But the thing that is most interesting about this particular realm is the lack of ability to see causation. Now, the other realms may not see causation either, but there is such, um, often such pain, such torture, that the aspiration is to the good. So in a way, the lower realms have the highest aspiration for freedom, for liberation. The lower realms, as all of us know who've been suffering a lot, we want to get rid of the suffering. We want to be free. We want to get beyond it. And so those beings who are in these lower realms desire liberation, desire freedom, passionate, <clears throat> passionately. And so that very passion for liberation is intense. I often think, not quite, yeah, sort of in this way. Harada Roshi used to go to India, and he would teach in India. And in India, people, he often used to teach the, uh, 
um, Delhi, what's the word? My mind has slipped. The untouchables. What do they call? What's the current name for them? Dalit. Dalit, yeah. Often teach the Dalit. And he would come back and then he would teach us Americans. And he would, you know, when he first made come back, he would sort of roll his eyes and say, oh, you people, you're so unpassionate. You're so, uh, you, know, you have so little interest in the Dharma. You, you kind of practice when you're comfortable or when you're, you know, you should or you ought, but you don't have any passion about the Dharma. Whereas the, the Dalits that he taught in India, they had a lot of passion for liberation. They would really practice really, really, really intently. And he loved to go to India because of the intensity of people's aspiration. So the hellish realms, the lower realms, which in one way are the very most negative, darkest, un most unhappy realms, are also the realms that may be closest to liberation, may be closest to freedom, may be closest to awakening, may be closest to Buddhahood because of the passion for liberation that is there. Now the human animal realms, that passion is not so intense. In a way, they're, they're mirror images of each other. The human realm has its animal-like creatures. It has people in hell. It has people who are in heavenly realms. I often think of the human realm as, they say it's a realm of choice, a realm where we ha can actually look at karma and we can actually make a choice to turn our mind this way or turn our mind that way. We can actually choose to practice Dharma or choose not to practice Dharma. We have some real choice and some freedom because we can see in this realm hellish and heavenly states. And so we can actually make some choice. Versus in the deep, darkest places, there is no choice. You just want to get free. And of course, you'll try anything unhealthy, whatever seems handy, you grab at. And often that very grabbing creates the swirling of the sangha, of samsara. So in the human realm, which all of us get to inhabit, thank goodness, we're very fortunate. You know, most of the beings there have at least between five and one digit on each hand. And most of the beings there have that many extremities. And most of the beings there have some capacity for creativity. But, you know, an or what I think of as the human realm, you know, f people who are farmers, craftspeople, people who, are, who, who are, don't have very much, but they have plenty to live with, that they've got the ordinary routine, the life is, just, is continuing, that they... They, they are engaged with what they're engaged with in a very, um, you know, some days content, some days not content. So then, assuming there is a little higher place on the pyramid, we come to the Asura realm, the Titan realm, the, the demigod realm, the place where the claws of the left hand of impermanence are firmly fixed. And I think, in a way, a lot of people that we know inhabit that realm. They say it's a step up, in a way, from um, the human realm, because it's a realm that, that has lots of material comforts, that has lots of attributes, that has lots of privilege, that has lots of um, advantages, that has all of the Not meat and potatoes, but, you know, pheasants and canopies and pheasants and fish row. What's the word for fish? Caviar. Caviar. Caviar, thank you. You know, having a, a brain that's beginning to get loose is interesting. So the human realm might have meat and potatoes and the the uh, Ashura realm might have, you know, pheasant and caviar. Can you uh, expand that? Um, I don't think it'll get any bigger. Just, just show a, a short a portion of it, at least the at least the center part. No, that's okay. It's okay. 
It's okay. Yeah, there they, there they are. Not such good resolution. Okay. So the part between two and three o'clock is the Ashura realm. Well, the hallmark of the Ashura realm is greed, self-centeredness, feeling superior. We have some in our leadership, a perfect icon of this Ashura realm. Greedy, self-centered, satisfied, wanting more, wanting more, wanting more. Because the wheel is turning on desire, turning on the getting and getting rid of, the Ashura realm is filled with getting and getting rid of. They have a lot, a lot of stuff. We are the richest country in the world, in some ways. More stuff than anyone in the world. At least it used to be that case. And yet we want more, more, more. We've got so much, and yet we want more, more. And who, what do we want more from? We don't want more from the lower realms, although you might think a little differently if you're, if you're engaged in the meat eating reflections. You may want a lot from the human, from the animal realm in that regard. But what people usually want more for is they want more power and more acknowledgement. They want the top of the eight worldly winds. They want more pleasure and more recognition and more authority. And <clears throat> the top of the eight worldly winds. They'd like to skim the, the waves off and just take the half, top half of the waves. Forget the bottom half. And so it's often shown in this realm you see there between uh, one and two, there are all the Asuras trying to attack the gods, trying to attack the people who have what they want, what they think they want. Always at war. So I often think of the Asura realm as being generals. I think of the Asura realm as being warlords. I think of the Asura realm as being very aggressive business people who have got so much and they want more, they want more, they want more. And they want more from those who have. Those who have. And again, there are realms we cannot see, that we can only imagine, we can only touch on. From a human perspective, because that's all we can see, is we can only see this from the human perspective. From the human perspective, the heavenly realms are what we humans think of as heavenly. You know, music and scent and color and pleasure and... And I suspect, according to all the sutras, there are heavenly realms that are way, way, way beyond the human realm. And the sutras all are talking, they talk about the non-beings that we cannot see that are still part of the circle. So we have heavenly times in our life, and we have less heavenly times in our life. And we have really bad times in our life, and we have less bad times in our life. So in any realm, the comparative mind is, functions quite enthusiastically. There is liberation in every realm. So there is no realm, in a way, that ha does not have that possibility. However, the upper realms, certainly the, the upper um, left quadrant over there, the Ashura and the God realm, <clears throat> comparable to the Pretas and the Hellish realms, the Pretas and the, those in the Hellish realms, they want, they want, they want liberation because they are suffering so much, they want it terribly. They may be a little misguided in their direction, but they want liberation. Whereas these upper realms, they say, I've got so much. I've got so, I want more of it. I want to keep it. I want to keep it. And so it may be that in terms of actual liberation, in terms of actual freedom, in terms of actual um, Buddhahood, realization of the Dharma, that the disadvantage is the upper realms because 
the desire for real liberation diminishes. And they say that in the heavenly realms, they feel so good and so happy, and the heavenly realms are, are so pleasant and so full that there's no reason. Why would I want anything else? And so the aspiration for awakening, in a way, diminishes the higher you go. And the challenge of the heavenly realms, they say, is we, and we all know this, that when we're feeling really, really, really good, when things are going really well, we get, I want to keep it, I want to keep it, I want to keep it. I don't want to let it go. It's perfect right now. Don't change anything. And of course, inevitably, change happens. They say that in the heavenly realms, the, 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 the beings, when they're about to near the end of that karmic cycle, they start sweating and they start smelling and they start seeing gray hair and they start realizing, oh, it's impermanent. And they become terrified that they're going to fall into the hellish realms. Because if you're a comparing mind, the more you compare, the more hellish it becomes. And so if you're in a heavenly realm and you've got this great level of comparison, the more you start comparing it, the more you start comparing it, the more you start comparing it, the worse, the worse, the worse, the worse, the worse you are. Well, that's why appreciation of where one stands, appreciation of the temporary pleasure of one's particular experience, appreciation of whatever state we are in, looking into it, not running from it, not discriminating and saying bad, bad, good, good, but the non-dual awareness of every state is the place of liberation. Is the place of liberation. So, we know these states psychologically. We see these states in the world. I mean, there, are, there are people who have got so much wealth and so much pleasure and so much that they don't know what to do with it. And there are people who've got so little and they are so tortured. I think of often people in Syria, you know, in the middle of a war zone with coronavirus, trying to escape without water, without adequate food, you know, all kinds of medical issues. It's a hellish place from my vantage point. And of course, what would make, makes them hellish from us is we imagine I'm in the human realm and I imagine being over there in one of these other realms and then our imagination is what makes the realm attractive or unattractive. Now, if we look at ourselves and our society and we look at beings, they're always in transition, always. Every circumstance is in transition. People have a little and they get more and more and more and then they lose it all and they get less and less and less and they, they are young and they grow stronger and stronger and stronger and they get old and they grow weaker and weaker and weaker and they have, everything is going very smoothly and the weather is great and everything is going very badly and the weather is not so great and then you know, a disease comes along and everything is great and the disease disappears and everything is not great or vice versa. You know, the wheel just keeps turning. The wheel keeps turning. The wheel keeps turning. Now, one of the things that keeps the wheel turning is always thinking, it's better on the other side of the fence. It's better over in that pasture. If I could just get everybody into that pasture, that pasture, that pasture, that pasture. Yeah, thank you. The eyes on the figure of impermanence, on the figure of the demon of death, which again is not quite accurate. The three realms, seeing the realm of desire, form, and formlessness. And we're considered in the realm of desire. The realm of form is the realm of pure form without, uh, uh, without all the, the extra stuff that we bring to it. And the realm of the formless is perhaps, perhaps the realm of mathematics or something like that. 
So acknowledging that there is this aspiration for improvement, whatever way that seems, because it looks different from different states of mind, there is this aspiration that we all have. And if the aspiration gets sidetracked towards the material, if it gets the aspiration is for liberation, we have that capacity in every realm. Now, I was asking uh, Harada Roshi one time, I said, okay, well, let's say the, the aspiration, the goal of Dharma is get off the wheel, get off the wheel of samsara, get out of the rat cage of, of endless becoming, get out of the rat race of endlessly being someplace else and doing something. Well, if you're out of that rat race, well, then what? And he said, you will be truly human at that point. It's good enough. It's impermanent. <laughs> so to... No, it's, it's the computer. It's okay. Yeah, thank you. So, I think it's just a really helpful way of looking at our life and our, our world. That it's always in transition. There's always the liber- possibility of liberation. That what we think of as not so good might actually be the most advantageous. What we think of as great might actually be the most disadvantageous. We don't know. You know, it all depends on where people are turning their mind in these realms, from a Dharma perspective. Liberation is always possible. And it's not possible in the next field over. It's not possible where the grass is greener. It's not possible on some other continent. It's not possible in another part of town. It's got to be possible right where we sit, stand, walk, or lie. If it's not there, where else could it be? So when we are engaged with all the things that we're engaged with right now, coronavirus or climate change or uh, racism, to hold it in a view of, this is normal. This is just change. Just the ebb and flow of karma. That's right, I didn't talk about karma. This is normal. That's normal. It's all normal. It's all changing. None of these, nobody's stuck. It's all in process. And then we have the piece of what do I need to do? What is my heart calling me to do in my life? We all get up in the morning and we do things. We don't not do things. If we try not doing things, we're still doing something. We all are doing things, so, and we all don't do the same thing. I mean, we all get up and go to the toilet. We all eat. But if you look around the room, we sure are dressed differently. Even those of us who wear the same clothes look differently. We all have different haircuts. Even those of us who have the same supposedly haircut, it looks different. Different hairs, different shapes of heads, different... <coughs> Everything's different. So we all have differentiation as part of our being. What is it that you are called to do? What is it? And as I, this is a whole different lecture, talk. <clears throat> the imaginative mind is very helpful for the direction you want to move in. I want to move in the direction of freedom and racial, racial equality. Great. It's not helpful as a comparative state right now because, you know, things are as they are right now but it moves us in a direction. And so what are those movements that are in us? What are the, what's the movement that we are called to? And of course that changes. My, my aspiration for Dharma, my aspiration for practice now is very different than it was when I was 25. It changes. How we turn our mind, moment to moment, day by day, We create heaven or hell. We create liberation or bondage. 
the last little, little piece. Anybody have any comments, any advice, any thing I missed, anything I've misstated? Mr. Hosen. When we were talking about Harada Roshi, and we said, well, what if somebody gets off this wheel? And he said, well, they complete your demon? Is that right? Yes, I said. Now he was talking, he was talking to me. He wasn't talking to, he wasn't doing this abstractly. So I want to get off the wheel of, I want to get off the wheel of endlessly becoming, I want to get off the wheel of suffering. Well, so, so what? What do I become? You become truly human, truly yourself, truly present. With that Tonka, um, when Ali zoomed it out, um, Shakyamuni is up in the right corner. Oh. As part of the, the Tanka, in the upper right corner is always the Buddha or Valakateshvara or sometimes Jizo or Shinrezi, one of the enlightened beings. And they're always pointing toward the Pure Land, pointing toward liberation, which is in the upper left corner as you're looking at that. So it just, again, says liberation is always possible. There's always calling, calling toward freedom. Yeah. I think the whole thing is interesting. Anybody else have any comments, insights, objections? Well, is there another motivation that is as strong as suffering? Or is that the only true source of clarity? That's a great question. I know. That's a great question, because if you're suffering, your desire for getting liberation is constant. It does not waver. You want to be free. You want to be well. You want to be... It does not waver. So, if our desire for the Dharma, if we've touched states of oneness, of clarity, of <clears throat> spaciousness, of, of liberation of the Dharma, do we also have that same absolutely unwavering devotion toward the Dharma, towards those as, as people who are in hellish realms do? In my experience, probably not. You know, we're in a comfortable realm, and so we like to fall back in comfort. But that's just my... It's a great, great question to ponder. Lama, do you have anything to say about that question? I think that the, I read something the other day that Shanti Deva said this suffering has no location. And I was thinking then in the Bodhisattva path, because of the truth of suffering is that it has no locale, that we can take on the suffering of others. And my own experience of taking that on is that then that's a process of loving. And so that suffering becomes the blessing of love, and that is, that is also excellent fuel for practice. Thank you very much. That's very clear. If anybody at home didn't, didn't hear that, uh, Lama Lakshya was just saying that Shantideva um, says suffering has no location. And if it has no location, that means it could be anywhere. And that means the motivation for liberation can be anywhere. And that a bodhisattva takes that very suffering on, turns it into love and loving-kindness, and then uses that suffering and that love as an aspiration for awakening, for walking the path, for helping others. Is that accurate? Is that what you said? No, thank you. Karma is real. Karma is real. The way we turn our mind moment to moment is real. Everything has an effect. In this moment, there is no karma. This moment, everything arises spontaneously without past or future. And yet, also, every direction we turn our mind, left, right, up, down, has a karmic impact. And the more we, often we turn our mind one way or another way, the more often we do that, the more it forms habit patterns. Perhaps it even changes the brain. Perhaps the brain is, forms new sulci or something that 
new neural pathways. And so it's said that the more on this human realm, the more we do something, whether we're playing the violin or we're practicing Dharma or whether we're you know, playing computer games or gardening or whatever, the more we do something, the more that tendency grows, the, the more that direction grows, the more competency we have in that area. And so in Dharma, we may start off you know, fragile and uncertain and unsure and not having had any real experience, don't have any real foundation of confidence. But if we keep turning ourselves toward Dharma, we keep turning ourselves to what is true, what is true, how can I help others, how can I help others, then that very turning has a karmic effect. That very turning shapes who we become. So on one hand, there is liberation everywhere. On the other hand, we can turn our mind toward what is beneficial and healthy, or we can turn our mind away from it. And that makes a difference. And that's part of what keeps the wheel spinning. There are four other levels of the of, of experience. Beyond this, the four Buddha realms, Shravaka Buddha, Prajeka Buddha, Bodhisattva, and then the full Buddha. And depending upon which tradition you're in, they look at those differently. So it may be that we're turning our mind toward grasping and negative things. Uh, the wheel keeps turning like this. If we turn our mind toward liberation and the Dharma, then the other realms of existence come into being. I don't know. I'm curious to find out. Hopefully with some of you. <clears throat>